Welcome everyone to Paranormal Roundtable. I'm your host, Josh Turner, and with me is my trusted companion, Anthony. Okay, I guess you're the trusted companion. I was going to say oh, Tony, definitely. but you just said Anthony, so. Banjo. I mean, I'm the trusted I one. I mean, are, he's, are you though, really? I mean, he's definitely a companion. I don't know if I would trust you. <laughs> okay, well anyways, Anthony Well, you're not a and, companion either. You're just more like an acquaintance, I think. Anthony so. and Mushu are here today. Y'all can fight it out for who's the trusted companion. Um, but he, he, here's it's the not thing. not really a fight. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, uh, I, for once we agree because I think my actions speak for themselves. So. <laughs> <laughs> anyways, folks, yeah, okay. We're going to have a fight here before the show is over. Hopefully not, but... Hopefully, once the show is over, then you know we can decide outside who's the toughest. Although it's like twenty five degrees, so I don't think I want to go out there and, and watch y'all. Y'all can, you just, can banjo can go out there. Whoever comes in, I'll know that's the winner. He's my stand in. Banjo can fight for me. Yeah, I'd rather fight Tony than Banjo. Banjo's actually pretty chill. You just give him a delicious treat, and he's fine. Yeah, but he's more intimidating. Yeah, but if you start <laughs> beating on me, <laughs> you start beating on me, he's going to join in. So oh. it's automatically a two-on-one. Well, there you go. So let's just skip yeah. the middle, so just man. Take him out Funny, now. though, is when, whenever we do the play hit thing, like we pretend to hit you, and he he, he does that where he gets all yeah. snipping yeah. and biting. He doesn't do it to me. Well, he does it to me, too. Like, like if I hit myself, it'll go after me. Oh, my God. <laughs> Because, like, if Nelly or Anthony or, or any of the people, this is honestly, folks, Banjo is Tony's little dog. and But but he won't do it to me. He'll, like, roll over on his back and kind of act goofy. <laughs> and I'm like, Tony, if I ever decided to start wailing on you, this, this dog does not have to do <laughs> No, he, he's all about, like, trying to cue you up to stop you, to mm-hmm. distract you. Like, like everybody else, he'll try to bite him. Mm-hmm. Like, but for me, he just kind of goes, eh, and he rolls over on his back. And <laughs> I, I don't know. I, he likes me a lot. I think because when he was, you know, younger and you had to go to work, you know, you were working at a site where you couldn't take him with you. And, and when it was, it was in the spring and it was like three months and it just stormed like every day. Like it was this period where it just rained a whole lot. Yeah. Um, and he was just always running and getting in the bed with me because he was terrified. Yeah, he hates thunder. From- yeah, he's scared. He's scared. So, so he, he would he'd crawl down into the bed. And so I guess I made him feel safe or something. So him always being with me when Tony was at work, I think we just kind of bonded. And so he likes me a lot. And so he kind of more like he pleads with me like don't don't do that don't do that that's enough you don't need to do that he's like Grogu from uh from the Mandalorian, Mandalorian. puts his little paw up like no 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 but uh, I, I finished watching that's actually really good the yeah, third yeah, season watching it. it was damn good dude I enjoyed it now the first couple episodes was a little slow but then by the last three episodes it really got it I, it was good so I'm giving you a recommendation folks check that out but I'm a Mandalorian fan anyway but uh, anyway that being said. We have a show tonight. We got to get the prelims out. We got a paranormal roundtable group page or group group on Facebook, right? Yeah. Go join it. We got paranormal lounge, paranormal holistic killing, paranormal wolf parent uh, par- PRT fan page. Um, we have the Quad Coalitions of Sciences, and then we're also with partnered with Barton Unley and Humanoids, who's one of our partners. So that being said, don't forget. Last but not least. The Paranormal Roundtable Prayer Group. Nelly created that, and we have a few hundred people in there, and it's done really well, and we pray for people who have needs. And it is, uh, it's nice to have the community like that. Uh, the Also, the other thing I wanted to talk about is we have a live stream every Friday and Sunday on YouTube. It is an exclusive to YouTube. The one on Friday, we have a guest every Friday. And every Sunday we retell stories, right? Patreon is a 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 dollar tier. Each tier you get more and more and more swag. It would call a swag bag. Ten dollar tier is very basic. You just get an autograph book, some stickers, and a keychain. Uh twenty dollar tier, you get all that, but then you get uh, a, a t-shirt, right? Yeah. T- uh, twenty or thirty dollar tier after two and it's all after two months, right? After two months of the thirty dollar tier, you get an autograph book. Or do you get two autograph books from mm-hmm. different authors? Once you get to the forty dollar tier, you get my book plus an autograph book from another author, and then fifty dollar tier, you get both of my books, and then the two like it's everything with the forty dollar tier gets, but you get both my books. Yeah. So you literally get three books. Um, you get two books with the thirty dollar tier, three books with the forty dollar tier, 
and both of my books and then two other books with the with the fifty dollar chair, all autographed by different authors like Nick Redfern, Lyle Blackburn, Barton Nunley, et cetera, et cetera. So that being said, let's get started here. Um Oh, and then, of course, every swag bag comes with, like, a shirt or a hoodie or something, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. If it's wintertime, we try to give you the hoodies. Uh, right now, everybody's really enjoying the PRT zip-ups. That has been yeah. a huge, huge yeah, seller. pretty popular. Like, we have been selling those like hotcakes, and it has been a great way to support the show. And I love that, that that because you can not only support the show that way, you know, especially with the Patreon. You know, you, you get something because I want you to have that to wear. Yeah. You know, these Tuesday shows, we're going to start dropping uh, the link to them on the Paranormal Roundtable group. Go leave a comment. And if your comment is chosen, guess what? You're a winner. And we'll mail you off some swag. We have been so slammed with work. And then we had a bunch of stuff, a bunch of upheaval going on for the last two or three months. We've had to scale back on the giveaways. And it was all been by legal advice that was given to us. Um, but we're going to start doing them again. And the Patreon, we know that if you're paying money to be a Patreon member, you're not going to, you know, turn around and say something stupid and be mean, whatever. So, that you know, that that was the big problem was that somebody we gave stuff away to claim some craziness. And we're like, you know what? We don't want to deal with that. Uh, and that person has not stopped, you know. And folks, if you could just try to ignore the crap the, the 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 trash talk that's been going on um we tried to make peace but these people just don't want it and they're not going to do it and so we're just going to we're going to rise above it we're going to try and pay it as little attention as possible and just let let legal everything take its course that's what we got to do because obviously they just they're not interested in peace and so we got to do what we got to do it's a shame it's a damn shame i don't want to have to dump a bunch of money into that but it's part of the growing pains of, you know, doing what we're doing. We're now at 30,000 people on YouTube and we, and we got like thousands of other people that watch the sh that listen to the show on different, uh, platforms like Spotify. Um, and we're on all of them. We're like Google, what Apple, pretty much Podbean, uh, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, pretty much anywhere you can listen to podcasts, uh, more on Stitcher, all those different like popular platforms. Mm-hmm. So that being said, we, we got we got to record, we got to do this, and then tomorrow, um, I got a bunch of more recording to do, and then we got to do the show on Sunday. So let's get started here. <clears throat> what this this episode is interesting. I it, I talked a little bit about it when we had Stetson Lewis on on the a uh, couple weeks ago. Yeah, he was and a really good guest. Really good guest. Yeah, great guy, bull rider, and a uh, a. A cage fighter, yeah. Really tough guy. So w w what we need to talk about tonight, it's we, we, we mentioned it on the show, and, and we're going to discuss it. Um, a guy reached out to me, and all I can tell you is he, he, li it's, he lived in Tallahassee, Florida, okay? And he since has moved across the country, which I don't blame him. Um, but he, he had a relationship with a woman how do I, she, she wasn't a Wiccan, but she was like, she, he called her pagan or something, but he found out that it was much more than that. She was in this sort of Egyptian, uh, I, I would call it a cult. Yeah. Like, a, like one of those weird, like mystery schools. Mm -hmm. What he found out was that she was into this, what they call the church of set. Yeah. And it is, there's different offshoots of it according to what she told him she left the church and kind of went on her own with this little group that kind of broke off and did their own thing whatever and she got him involved not he didn't get involved in the meetings and all that but like into the egyptian culture um she claimed that she was reincarnated as a high priestess of some you know whatever and, you know, and so he was just kind of like, oh, okay. And so I, and I asked this question. I asked this guy the, the, a simple question. I said, let me ask you a question, Matt. I call, I'm going to call him Matt. And I said, Matt, how, how did you get involved with this person? He said, she was hotter than the sun. <laughs> so, <laughs> man, that. that's all it takes. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I mean, you can step all over us as long as you're pretty. Yeah, exactly. And then it's like, 
Oh, you're in a you're in a satanic cult. Okay, yeah, I'm all for it. They, they don't care. Yeah, you know? that's all you got to say. I mean, I'm I'm ready to join the cult right now. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's that's just how horrible they are. Uh, and that's that, I mean that for all men. Cause yeah, we, we have we, a serious problem in that regard. Mm-hmm. You know, a good looking woman can you know whatever. Oof. But anyway, what ends up happening? He and 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 it spirals out of control. They went to this like get get together, like this little meeting, and it was he said the one and only meeting he went to, and it was like they they met some people, and then they said, "Hey, we're having we're going to be at this uh, convention the next day, whatever." And it was like a magic convention where people get together and they they some of them sell stuff, and then they have all kinds of weird paranormal stuff, and then there's tarot reading, all this stuff, you know, Ouija boards and all this. So he shows up at this little convention uh, in another part of Florida, and he said it was like a five-hour drive, and they get down there, and he said, dude, it was like a day and a half of just being a fish out of water, uh, but his girlfriend bought him this supposedly enhanced magical onk necklace, and uh, she wears one, too, with like this weird crystal on it which is black, which he thought was kind of, you know, weird that she had this crystal that she said at one time it was clear and it was black. I mean, well, that's, you know, it's been, you know, absorbed dark energy. and But she still wears it. And I told him, I said, he said, you know, so eventually they got together and she started to kind of drift away from all that, you know, and a couple of years go by and they had their ups and downs. They split up and they got back together and she convinced him that there was no more. She wasn't into that anymore, which is one of the the, the, the problems he had with it. And he was a Christian, but he was like kind of paying lip service to it. And then he said, you know, I really, I knew it was wrong. I shouldn't have been involved with, you know, and let her, I shouldn't have entertained it in any way. Um, but, but they got together and he started going back to church and she would not go. It was a big problem. And then, you know, she starts getting serious and she decides she wants kids. And he balked. He was like, I don't want to have kids with this person. I don't want to be with somebody who doesn't believe like I do. And so that became an issue. And here's what ends up happening. They, 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 they're together. They're living together. There's all this, you know, whatever. They split up again, but this time he said it felt different. It was like it was done. It was over, you know. Right after they split up and it was like final, like, you know, it was like I'm done, you know. He said he felt like there was this heavy weight lifted off of him. A few months go by and he starts dating this other girl. And right away, like right away, she starts messaging him on Facebook and like basically cyber stalking him. And telling him that it's not over. You don't just leave somebody like that. You don't do do people like that and all this stuff. And he's like, like what? Like, you know, you're always insulting my beliefs and my religion and I've taken it and I feel like I'm not, I'm not being respectful to my, my beliefs and to my, my, my God, you know? And she's like, well, I have my God too. Well, supposedly she was already done with all of this and you know, the first thing that happened, he was laying in the bed with his girlfriend. They were watching TV and they, they were eating pizza. And she's like, we're laying there in bed and we hear this rattling around in this drawer. That's the nightstand. And it's on the other side of the bed where my girlfriend's at. She looks at me and I look at her and she's like, what is that? And so she opens the drawer and it's the, the only thing in that drawer is just like a couple little things, you know, that wouldn't have been making the noise. Um, and then the necklace. Oh, he kept it? Yeah. Yeah, it was in the drawer. He said it was just in there, sitting in there. And it was on that side where his ex used to, to sleep. So she had his necklace in there. He gave it back to her and just, she just threw it in the drawer. And she's like, what is this? She pulls it out. And he said, almost instantaneously, I felt like this warmth, heat coming from that object, coming over my body and fl flushing my skin and just, you know, it's like when you take niacin is what he told me. And I said, oh, yeah, I know. I know that weird flush you get when you take niacin. And he said, yeah, it was weird. I felt like I had just taken some niacin. 
And he's like, and, and so I grabbed it just instinctively. I don't know, something just made me kind of snatch it out of her hands. And I was like, uh, w- you know, why are you holding this? Why did you pull it out of the drawer? She's like, well, I don't know. Something was making noise and there's nothing really in there but that and a couple other things. And so he took the necklace and he just threw it in the in the nightstand on the other side of the room or the dresser, I'm sorry. And he said, I didn't think nothing of it. He said, the next day I go into the, into the bathroom, take a shower. You know, my girlfriend's gone. She, she, she still lived in her own apartment, whatever. And he goes, and I'm living in this, this older house. And he's like, and I have this feeling of lightheadedness that comes over me. And he goes, and I, I'm holding my head and I feel like I'm going to pass out. He's like, and I'm, I'm standing there in my bathroom about to step into the shower. And I thought, oh man, I better go lay down. I, I'm, I'm dizzy. I don't, my chest started hurting and my heart started beating fast. And I thought, I'm about to go unconscious. He's like, and then he goes, I see this. He's like, I don't know what it is, like a black form standing in the tub. Now he has a shower and a tub. It was two, two separate things. Yeah. And I said, yeah, that's kind of like my bathroom. I had the same thing. But he said, dude, he goes, I see this thing kind of standing in the tub, but it was almost like it was standing on top of the tub, which would have been impossible because, you know, and he said this thing was about seven foot tall. And he goes, and it was black and I'm looking at it and it's like, kind of like looking like a glitch, like something that's kind of like blinking in and out of reality. And I, and I look and I think, what the heck is that? And for a minute there, he goes, it looked like a cartoon rabbit, like a black cartoon rabbit. He goes, and then it was just gone. And I thought, whoa, what the heck was that? He goes, and then I start to feel like I'm breathing fast. I can't control my breathing. He's like, so ultimately I ended up calling 911. He's like, the, 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 by the time the ambulance got there and EMTs came, he goes, I felt perfectly fine. And I'm like, look, I think I just had an episode. And they said, well, maybe you should come down to the hospital and get checked out. It would probably be in your best interest. He, re- he refused. He said, no, nah, I think I'm okay. I'm good. I just needed to lay down. Um, and so he called in to work. And he said, I just had an episode. And I had the, the EMS here, you know, whatever. So he goes and he lays down and goes to sleep. Next day, or, or there, that night, he wakes up and he feels like his bed is vibrating. And he wakes up and he's just like, and he's like, I'm drenched in sweat. And my heart is like palpitating. I could feel it. It was horrible. And then shortly after that, he was diagnosed with AFib. And he said, I had never had it before. And I've had it. I know that what it's like. And he said, dude, my pulse was bouncing around all over the place. You know, he goes, but this was the first time that I'd ever experienced anything like that. And once again, I see this, what looks like a black statuesque like creature or something kind of like blinking in and out of my reality. What little bit I could see of it, it looked dog-like. And he's like, and I, I, I sit up and I'm just like, I'm, I feel like I've been running a marathon and I'm drenched in sweat. So he's like, I called my doctor the next day. He's like, I couldn't get out of bed. I was just so tired. I kept going back to sleep. I felt like my energy was being drained. He calls his doctor the next day and uh, sets up an appointment. He goes in, you know, later that afternoon, goes to the, the, the clinic, and they run some tests. And then he does a stress test. And, of course, they find out that he has AFib, that he's, been, he's going into AFib. He's going in and out of it. And he said, I ended up uh, at the doctor's office, you know, and they did all these tests. And he said, then I started having problems breathing when I slept, and I thought I was getting sleep apnea. He goes, and my girlfriend kept saying, there's something, you know, going on, you know, something going on with your body. You need to go get checked for sleep apnea. You're, you're, you're like, you're not breathing in the middle of the night. But he was having these dreams that something was holding him down on the bed and was like choking him while he was asleep, like holding his neck um, into where he couldn't breathe. And then he felt like there was this hand that was coming over his, his face and then one of these dreams, his girlfriend shakes him awake while he's laying there in bed. And they had fallen, he had fallen asleep watching a show. He's like, I still remember we were watching uh, reruns of Seinfeld. He's like, and I was sitting there in the bed and I was just like asleep all of a sudden. And then I feel this presence come over me and I had like this sleep paralysis. And then there was something shaking me. And then it turned into like kind of bouncing. He's like, and then my girlfriend was shaking me awake. And I look up and for a split second, <clears throat> I see this weird looking creature with this snarl on its face and it's black and it's got these yellowish eyes and they're glowing and it's got this weird like chest plate on its body. He goes, and then I recognized what it was. 
He's like, it was Anubis. Like it was the, the creature. Like it was like an Anubis looking creature. And he's like, she, he's like, did you see it? Did you see it? And she was like, no, I didn't see it. What are you talking about? And he's like, the weird wolf looking creature that was standing right here. And she, she's like, no, I just saw you kind of bouncing up and down on the bed. And she's like, it looked like you were being attacked, like spiritually attacked. Now, she's a very devout Christian. So she begins to pray. Um, and then one of the preachers that, that at their church, uh, one of the deacons actually tells them to put salt around the house, you know, it's a purification, whatever. So he does. Then then for about two or three days, everything stops, and you know, and he he's got his crosses, he's sleeping with them by the bed, and he's doing all these other things, you know. And he said everything kind of stopped for a little bit. He goes, but then he's like, about a week goes by after we had talked to the deacon, which was the day after the attack. He's like, you know, I, I I'm walking to the bathroom and I see this thing that looks like a man crawling on all fours run from one of the upstairs bedrooms across the hall into the other room. And he's like, and it did it right in front of me too. And he goes, it looked like a, a, a like something black, black, like, you know, like onyx black, you know, like obsidian. Yeah. Like obsidian, like black. He didn't use those words, but he said solid black, you know, it was, and it was real shiny. And he said that it looked almost like it was a, a black, like, you know, gemstone or something the color of this thing. He said, and it looked like it was wearing a loincloth and it like had these dog-like legs and it ran into the other room. And he goes, and I see it and I'm thinking, what in the hell was that? He's like, so I slowly walk up into the hallway and I look into the bedroom and I see this something move really quickly and go through the wall and it was gone. And he goes, that had to be like something spiritual because we're upstairs. And so, and it went through the wall so he's just like, he shakes his head. He, he's like, I'm just, I'm imagining this or something's, you know, something's going on. I don't know why this is happening, but it is. And so he gets really, really, really uh, terrified. And once again, he starts having problems breathing. And at this point, he's just like, I got to go back and lay down. My head is swimming. He's like, so I use the bathroom. I go back to, to, to lay down. He's like, his girlfriend, she comes home from work that afternoon and she said something, you know, she knew something was wrong. She says, something's really wrong. You know, she's like, you're, you're, you're going to sleep all the time. You're constantly tired. And so he told her, he says, there's something in this house that is messing with me. Well, he went to bed right after that. There was another night where he had a dream and he said that it was clear as day, like what it was. He said, and there was all this like smoke that came into the room it kind of like wafted in from the from the hallway. And he's like, and in the dream, I sit up because I think that the house is on fire. He goes, and then I do. I see this like weird looking quick flame. And then there's this like jackal headed demonic looking entity that comes out of the flame. And he says, and behind it, I can see like two more entities that look just like it, but they're smaller. And he says that this thing is carrying this weird looking like scythe looking uh thing in its hand and he's like and in the other hand there's like this black stone and he comes up and he tells me he says dude this thing holds it out he goes and when I, I stare at it and I look at it I realize that it's a human heart but it's really small and it's black and it's it's said he goes it did not speak with its mouth but he goes and in my head it says you will be judged and then it lifts up this weird looking scythe and he says dude I, and he described it to me so this scythe that he was talking about, I know what it is. It's called a kopesh, and it's it's a an Egyptian like weapon that was used by the ancient Egyptians. And he said that he he was describing it to me. And he says, and I, I, he goes, I looked it up. I knew what it was after the, you know after being with this crazy girl that he was with before. And he said that he goes, dude. At this point, I'm thinking, you know, all the weird stuff that she was saying on Facebook. And then she made a Facebook post that says. If you know, you know, and she put a picture of a black heart on her Facebook, like of a human heart that's like black, like it had been burned or something. And then she put these two crossed Kopesh like scythes, you know, right above it. And so he was like, yeah, she, she's sending him a message saying, so he contacts her. He says, look, you need to, we need to talk. And she's like, no, we don't. And he's like, yes, we do. We need to meet at a public place, and I want to talk to you. 
And so she obviously still in love with him or whatever. She says, okay, she agrees, um, which he thinks is what she wanted all along. Why can't you just dog me like a normal psycho? <laughs> Why do you got to take it to this level? So, so, so get this. He goes and he shows up at the coffee shop. We met at a Starbucks, he said, and I bring her this um, necklace. And he goes, you can take this necklace back. And there was a couple other little trinkets that she had given him over the years. And he's like, I don't, I don't want any of this. Here's my stuff. Take it all. And she's like, okay. So she takes it. And he says, you know, she, she took it so readily that it made me wonder if it was a mistake yeah. to be giving her that. He's like, and as he was leaving... He hears a voice like stands behind him and it says, you're mine. And like when she turned around, when he turned around, she was still in the, in the Starbucks and she was on the phone talking to somebody and he heard it again. And it said, you're mine. And he was like, what the hell? I'm going to go in there and take all that stuff back. Yeah. So he said, but no, but instead he did the opposite. He just got in his truck and took off really quick and was terrified. And so then he goes, dude, on the way home, he goes, you're not going to believe this wolf. Uh, he goes, you're not going to believe this. He goes, I, 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 this guy runs through a red light, smacks right into me, flips my truck over. He had like a, a small uh, truck. I think it was like a Frontier or something. He's like, flips my truck. He's like, and I roll like four times and then I get hit again by another vehicle. And he goes, and so it was like so crazy. He's like, and then I, I'm, I'm okay, but I end up in the hospital. And he goes, and I got a broken arm and, and, a, and a, my dislocated hip. And he said, so, so I go there and they're checking me out and everything. And he goes, my arm is broken in two places. He's like, but I'm, I'm alive. You know, and he goes, and I was sitting there. He goes, and I had a necklace with a cross on it and it was broken. And I was, it was in my hand into my sleeve of my shirt. It was tangled up in his sleeve. And he says, dude, I don't know. It was like God telling me, Hey, you're okay. He's like, but he goes, I was in the hospital and she goes, the, when I was on the medication they gave me, the pain medication, he said, my body doesn't do real good with pain medication. He's like, and so I started having these weird dreams. He's like, in one of these dreams, this doctor comes in and get this, he starts like messing with tools and things behind him and he can't see and this guy's really tall and he's looking and he's like, this guy's got this big, you know, bushy hair. He's like long black hair on this guy and he goes, what? What kind of doctor is this guy? It's huge, you know? And he's like, it was like a dream, but it was like, at the time, he, it was so real, he didn't know he was dreaming. Like, very lucid, right? He's like, and then this guy turns around, and it's like this werewolf-looking head, not like Anubis or anything like that. It just looked like a werewolf with, like, long hair, and it comes up to him, and it says, are you ready for pain? He goes, and this thing with this weird-looking hand digs his thumb into one of the cuts on his side because he had gotten banged up pretty bad and he got a bad gash on his leg and his uh, left side. And he said, dude, this thing sticks its thumb down into the, into the, into the incision and pops the sutures. And he's like, and I'm just like, ah, and I start screaming at the top of my lungs. And then I wake up to this nurse uh, helping me. And she's like, what's going on? And he's like, he's like, he looks down and his stitches had been busted and he's like, something just grabbed me. Something grabbed me. And she was like, when we walked in, you were putting your own thumb into your stitches. And <laughs> he was like, no, there was something there. And it was digging into my my side. And she's like, okay. Uh, like she didn't believe him. So the next day the doctor comes in and talks talking to him and says, look, we want to release you. Um, but, you know, you, you're, you're going to be here for a couple of days. But don't mess with your stitches. And he's like, I'm not. And the doctor says, no, we literally had two nurses come in and see you tearing your stitches off. So then he said, I don't know if it was the right thing to do or not, but I told this doctor, I said, I, I need to talk to somebody because my mind is like, I don't know what's going on, you know? And he starts to think maybe the medication is making him loopy, but he knows that this is probably part of the curse too, but he can't, you know, he can't put it all together. He's like, my mind is in a million different places. He's like, and my work is suffering. My job is threatening to fire me. And luckily, you know, they, they were cool because I'd gotten into a wreck and they were like giving me a reprieve, but I had already missed a bunch of work. And his boss had told him, you need to get your head out of your ass. Literally told him that. And so he's sitting there and he's like, my life is turning into a shambles. He goes, and then the only, the only steadfast thing was my church and my girlfriend. He said that the preacher came to talk to him, to see him. And to pray with him, and they read some scriptures, and he felt really good. 
And then he left. He's like, well, no sooner had he left and the phone rings. He's like, and I look and I, I grab the phone, you know, and um, he thinks it's his girlfriend because she would come up there to visit every day. And, and sure enough, it was. And she says, hey, honey, I'm going to be a little bit late coming up there today. Well, he hears a guy's voice in the background, like a giggling, laughing, whatever. And then he gets really upset and he's like, no, you know what? Don't bother. Just stay with your guy, but your boyfriend, whatever it is that you got going on. Don't talk to me. He's all mad. He hangs up. And then uh, about an hour and a half goes by and she shows up and brings him some food. And he's like, what are you doing here? I don't want, I don't want to talk to you. Get the hell out of here. I heard the, the dude in the background. And she's like, what dude? What are you talking about? He goes, you called me earlier and said you were going to be late. She's like, no, I didn't. She's like, and I'm, and I'm actually early today. And he's like, what the hell? He goes, yeah, you called me and you told me that you weren't going to be here until like, you know, whatever. And she's like, well, obviously that's not true because here I am like, and I'm half an hour early. And she's, he's like, well, somebody called me and was, it was your voice. And there was some guy in the background laughing. And then she sits with him and she gets him to calm down and convinces him that it wasn't her. And she's like, look at my phone, look at the call log, you know, whatever. And so he goes to sleep, she's watching over him and she's reading to him. And one of the things he said that he liked to do was have her read like, like these old West books. I, I thought that was pretty cool. Cause I like Elmer Kelton. Yeah. It's one of the few, like, you know, Louis Lamore, but she was reading like some of these Western books, you know, whatever. I actually turned him on to Wild West Magazine, too. I don't know if they're still around, but I told him, I said, get some copies of them if you can. They're really good. I don't know if that's still a, a magazine or not, but I used to subscribe to it years ago, and I used to have a bunch of them. But anyway, he said that he would look into it. He better not be lying to me. But anyway, <laughs> so we're sitting there, and we're talking, and she's reading him from from one of these Elmer Kelton books. And... um you know, he said, dude, he, he goes, he falls to sleep while she's uh, reading to him. He goes, and then he wakes up like real quick. Like it was like a real quick, like mini dream he had. But in this mini dream, while she's sitting there talking to him, this wolf like creature comes through the door, puts her, his hands on her shoulders, both her shoulders and lifts her up off the ground and then bites her head. And then he, and he's like, she's screaming and her feet are shaking and there's all this blood. And he's like, I wake up and it's like this real quick dream. And then she's still sitting there and she's like, are you okay? And he's just like, I can't do this anymore. This, this, this he's like, uh, this is bad. And he said that after he had given that necklace and the other trinkets back to his ex-girlfriend, it got exponentially worse. He's like, it was like in on, it was like the curse, but on steroids. And so he, she, he, his girlfriend finally calls her and confronts her and says, look, I know that you're doing something to him. Matt is losing his mind. Can you please stop? You need to quit whatever you're doing. And she told her this. She says, what I did, I can't undo. And so she said, so you did do something. She goes, yes, I did. But there's nothing I can do about it now. She's like, I tried to stop it, but I can't. And she's like, and that the necklace, she's like, I, I need that necklace. And she's like, and I can't find it now. So the story that she tells her makes it even more jacked up. She tells her that literally while she was asleep, this weird panther-like creature comes through the window, like, like a, like a, first it was like a fog, a black smoke or whatever, like a fog settles in the room. This panther headed like creature. She didn't describe it as Anubis says that it goes into her drawer. She's laying there like, like having sleep paralysis Staring at this creature, the creature goes and grabs her necklace and his necklace, which they had bought together, and then takes them and like puts them into its mouth and devours them, then slowly shrinks down into this weird crocodile looking creature and then takes off out of the room. At that point, she could get up. She gets up out of bed. She has seen entities like this before, so it wasn't like something that scared her totally because she's been dabbling in this crap for years, obviously. She gets up, she follows it, and it goes straight out the front door, and the front door is wide open. And then she walks out, and then she can't find the necklaces. This is the story that she gave his girlfriend, right? Then he tells me, he's like, I try to talk to her again and tell her, look, stop playing games. You need to give me 
you know, this, th- that stuff back because it needs to be destroyed or whatever. And she's like, well, that's not going to happen because literally, and uh, what she called an Egyptian sentinel came in, ate those uh, trinkets, whatever, and then walked out the, the room. And he's like, and you expect me to believe this? And she's like, is it any more harder to believe than Anubis has been attacking you? Yeah. And he's like, I guess you have a point. And then he goes out on the deck of his girlfriend's uh, house where his, they went to visit, I guess, his um, girlfriend's parents. And they live way down in Southern Florida. He goes, and we go out onto the deck. He goes, and there's this canal right there. And literally it's full of alligators. You can see them. He's like, and I'm on the deck and we're up high on the second floor. So, you, you know, they can't like get to you or anything. He's like, and he goes, and before my eyes, he goes, I am wide awake. He goes, I am not stoned. I am not drunk. I am not anything. He's like, I am wide awake. He goes, and I witnessed something incredible. I see this alligator like creature come out of the canal, literally stand up on its hind legs, arms like kind of pop out. And it looks up at me and it walks straight up to the freaking house. He's like, and it is in my backyard. And it literally looks at me and it begins to talk to me mentally through my mind. And it's asking me to go with him. And I'm like, no, I'm not going with you. And this says, come, you need to be purified. And he's like, I'm not going with you. And he goes, and then I run inside the, to, to, to get my girlfriend who's on the phone with her mother. He's like, and I, I'm waving at her, trying to get her attention. And, and I can see this creature still standing there with its arms crossed, like, like just this anthropomorphic, like weird alligator man creature thing. And he's like, and I started thinking, and when I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm like, what is that? I've seen this before. It's like this crocodile headed looking thing, whatever. And then he thought, and it hit him. He goes, Sobek. That oh, is yeah. actually the, yeah. So, so then he starts like, like, like trying to, his mind, cause, cause he knew that his ex-girlfriend was into all this Egyptian stuff, you know? So then he, he, she gets off the phone. She, she tells her mom, I got to go. She comes out. And when she comes out, all they see is this brownish green, like mist that's like floating in different directions. And he's like, right there is where it was at. He goes, I just saw it. It's this creature. Uh, it, go, it goes by the name. And he told, he said the name, whatever. And then she's like, this is just too much. She's like, I can't, you know, there's like this Anubis creature showing up and then now this creature showing up, you know, and whatever. And so she, she, she just goes in the bathroom. She slams the door and she starts crying or whatever. She takes a hot shower. She comes out and then she's like, look, I'm sorry. I know it's not your fault. She's like, I know that what this other woman did, you know, it's causing all these problems. And he, he just kept on going to church, kept praying Started open. I told him this is what you know. He did the right thing to take an open Bible to the New Testament, put it in all the different rooms, you know. And and that's what I told him to do. Um, he still does that to this day, you know. And he says, "Yeah." He goes, "I didn't do it at that time. I only had it in one room." He's like, "But yeah, I'll take your advice because to this day he still has these visions, and he still sees this reptile-headed looking creature, and sometimes he'll see this thing that looks like a nubus, you know. And it's still happening to this day. Like he has not." been able to have like peace, you know, and, um, it's unfortunate, you know, the, the girlfriend eventually moved and he, he lost touch with her and her Facebook page is now just like, hasn't been used in a few years. He doesn't know anything about her or where she's at or what she's doing. Um, but he did have a guy contact him and this guy, um, we'll call him Dan, and Dan actually was a victim of this same woman. And he met this guy through another member of his church that says, hey, I know a guy that I used to go to AA with, and his name is Dan, and I, this is the same same town, right? So, I mean, you know, it's, it's a city, but it's not humongous where you're not going to run into people. And he said, you know, it was almost like, but but it could have been more than that. It could have been divine intervention because through this guy, he has kind of created a support, you know. And he said that this guy introduced him to another guy. And that guy we'll call Mark. Um, So Mark and Dan were all victims of this girl too. Like they had all had this same thing happen. Mark had only gone out with her for a few months. And she said when he walked out on her after she pulled some some weird shenanigan, um, which I'm not, it's an adult thing. I'm not going to get into it here. Um, But 
he said, I walked out on her. And then she's like, oh, you don't walk out on me. Watch what happens. And he said, oh, yeah, something crazy did happen. Now, here, we'll start with what happened to Mark, who is the guy that Dan Daniel that he introduced him to. Now, he met Daniel, like I said, from a guy from his church who was in AA. And that guy talked about his ex-girlfriend putting a curse on him. And everybody kind of laughed about it. But they were like, oh, it could be just the booze, whatever. He goes, no, I started drinking because of this woman. <laughs> okay. He's like, this witch caused it. All right. So anyways, what ended up happening, th this, this guy was driving home um, one day. He's coming back from, from southern Florida. He's driving all the way back up to the north. And he said, I see this big, giant, black, wolf-like creature coming out of the, 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 the swamp, literally, paralleling my truck and then whipping its head like a freaking uh, uh, ball and chain into the side of my car and pushing me off the road. I almost went off into the ditch into a swamp and then came back onto the road. And then I look and I see this creature and it's like not normal. It looks like a giant werewolf on all four legs with red eyes. And its tongue was like flicking back and forth. The weird thing about it was the tongue was super red and it was forked like a, like a, like a serpent's tongue. He's like, and so I gunned it and I got out of there and eventually it just veered off and went back into the swamp. The next day, this girl t t calls him and tells him, she's like, you like that? You like that? Do you want to keep playing games? And he's like, I'm not playing games with you. Uh, I'm not going to say her name, but he said, I'm not playing games with you. I just, I, I don't, don't know what this is. What do you know about that? And she's like, oh, there's more where that came from. So eventually... He starts having all kinds of issues, dude. The, the, another weird thing that happened to him, and I'm not going to get real deep into all the whatever. He was in his closet, and he was trying to find a shirt, and this something, some kind of black entity wrapped its arms around him. When he looked down, the, the it looked like two different uh, coils of a snake going around his body. And he felt this like heat that smelled like rotting meat on the back of his neck. And he just like fell forward. He's not religious and he didn't ask for prayer. I mean, he didn't uh, ask for anything, you know, for intervention. And so he just sat there suffering with this thing on the top of him until finally he woke up and he was on the floor uh, in his bedroom. And then <clears throat> he thought, you know, maybe it's a curse or maybe this apartment has something to do with it, whatever. He did have some pretty weird paintings that his mother had given him when he was young and thought, oh, maybe these paintings, she said, those paintings are gross. You know, you shouldn't, you know. Um, so he got rid of all these things in his house. He thought that was going to help. It didn't. Um, and as far as I know, the things are still going on with him too. Now, this other guy, Daniel, Dan, the guy that he met through his friend from church, this guy went through AA. He had a problem with alcohol. When he met... Um, Matt, Matt had said he had been sober for two years. What happened to this guy, which is really messed up, he found out that one of the times when they were split up, him and this girl, she started dating him. Well, when they got back together, she was still dating him for a few more months and he didn't know it. So yeah, she was two-timing him, which obviously the things that she's doing, that's the least of the things she'll do. And so he said that he, at that point, he didn't believe this woman anymore, that she couldn't, she had no control over it. Um, maybe the story that she gave his girlfriend was true, that some demon did eat the, those necklaces, but it's probably something that she summoned and to do that, you know what I mean? And to bind him to her. Now, this guy, Dan, said the same thing that this other guy said. She was obsessed with Matt and she talked about him incessantly. But she was also really, really, she had a libido, right? And so Dan said that she, she ended up like messing around with some other guy and they quit talking. So she came to her, his house and he's like, you literally messed around with my neighbor, okay? I'm not even going to get into it. He goes, you went out of town. She came over and started talking to the neighbor. Next thing you know, the neighbor didn't even know that that was his girlfriend. He just thought that she was some girl coming by. You know, and, and like she was going to drop off some package for a friend, according to her. And so they put two and two together. And he's like, dude, I'm so sorry. I didn't know. Well, everywhere this woman goes, it seems to be like there's some kind of chaos or whatever. So what, what, he, what she did with this guy, Dan, she tried to get him to help her get back at Matt. And Dan was like, for what? He's like, what did he do to you? So she made up all these stories that he beat her, he threatened her, 
and that it was him that was in this cult and got her involved and all this stuff and that she started doing drugs because of him. She just flipped the script on him. Flipped the script on him. Yeah. So he was thinking, this is just the evilest person in the world. Then when he meets him and realizes that this guy goes to church and this guy's friend that he was with with NAA, he's like, vouch for him, said, no, he's a really good guy. Um, they had a mutual friend. We'll call him Val. He's the one that kind of like put them together. Uh, and Val even had a run in with her. This woman walks over to his car while he's coming out of a supermarket. This is the guy Val that was in AA with the dude Dan, right? And he sees this crazy woman with this jet black hair throw a dead black bird onto his car, get in her car and drive off. He goes over there and there's a note on there attached to the bird that says, mind your own business. So then he, he's like, I don't know who I'm, I'm supposed to be minding my own business to. He's like, but it was after I introduced Dan to Matt. So then he said, this guy, Dan, this is where it gets even more messed up. The dude, Dan was at work and he was actually like working with, with uh, like a saw or whatever. And he cuts the tip of his finger off. And he said, it was like so freaky, dude. He goes, it's like, it's like the saw jumped, you know, and like just went, you know, like it did, it moved unnatural. And he's like, so I ended up going to the hospital and he goes, and I, I ended up having to have surgery, I had it reattached. I still to this day, you don't have any feeling in it. And this is what he's telling, you know, this is the guy telling me, Matt telling me what he told him. He said that another, that another accident happened and he ended up getting hit in the head with a pipe that, that almost took his eye out. But luckily for him, it just kind of glanced to whatever. He's like, the whole time I'm trying to battle alcoholism and I'm going through all this weird stuff. He goes, and then he's like, in my backyard, these two big black dogs burrow underneath the fence of my, my house, go into my dog's dog house. He's like, right before my, my, uh, my stepson's eyes, you know, he says, me and my ex, ex-wife, we have a, 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 she had a son before they were together, but he raised him like his whole life. So he said it's technically his stepson, but he treats him like it's his son. But he said that that um, right before his son's eyes, these two dogs start just killing their dog. Oh, no, no, no And then no th- th- this kid, though, he's not no punk. He's like a, a baseball player, you know, in high school. He goes and gets an aluminum bat and starts beating them to try to get them off of it. But it, the damage was done. They had to put the dog to sleep. But he managed to beat them. And then they chased him into the house. And then he, then when they went back to try to hurt the dog again, he ran back out there and started fighting him. And then finally, um, his cousin comes over and they, you know, with some video games because they were going to play PlayStation or whatever. He runs back there and he starts helping him. And he's got, luckily for him, he's got like spray, pepper spray. And he does security. So he's like, he sprays, you know, and they, they get the dogs off, whatever. They go away. And he said that that after that, Dan told him, he said, dude, all this stuff started happening because of this girl after I dated her, went out with her, whatever. He's like, and that not only that, but she slashed his tires and broke out one of the windows in his house. And and then he started dating this other girl and messed up, dude. He said, like, within like two weeks, her hair started falling out. And there was all this weird stuff. Like they both were having these like weird dreams of these weird, like uh, entities, the only way he could describe them, like these Anubis looking entities. And he said that she would put these things on her Facebook, like, you know, with the heart and all that. Well, get this, the other guys, Mark, Dan, and then this dude, Val, who didn't even date her, who just was able to bring them together. They all had the dream of this Anubis type creature coming to them. And, and according to what Matt was telling me anyway, and they, it was holding like a black heart in its hand. And then she posts on Facebook, if you know, you know. So, like, obviously, this uh, evil-ass woman, you know, like, she knew what she was doing, you know, and she oh, was, yeah. yeah. And then he's like, he goes, he goes I'm still friends with, with Dan to this day. I don't, I don't talk to Mark that much. He's like, um, because he moved to another town, but, um, and then we kind of lost touch with him. He goes, and then I moved across the country, you know. And uh, he said that one of the things that, that, that still happens to him to this day is sometimes he will wake up and he'll see this bird-headed looking creature uh, or it'll be like a, a, a wolf-headed looking creature or sometimes a reptilian looking creature and it'll be staring at him through his bedroom window and the blinds and the curtains will be wide open. A bird head would be Thoth, wouldn't it? Possible. Well, it depends. 
that would be one of of the uh, the Deities. possibility. Uh, thought was the one that helped uh, Isis bring Osiris back, basically to to bring him back. Um, but th- you know, this woman was into some weird stuff, and now now we got to break it down, and you got to wonder: Is this somebody who had the ability to summon these deities, or was it somebody who was able to make someone believe that these deities were attacking them, or were these just demons, just regular old demons masquerading, or were they really Egyptian demons? I mean, what were they? Give me your thoughts. I mean, <laughs> we just said thoughts. <laughs> I definitely think this is a case of ancient Egyptian witchcraft, basically. The term witchcraft is kind of, it's actually an umbrella term, to, in my opinion. Here in the West, whenever we hear like witch or witchcraft, we, we think of the classic like ugly hag, pointy hag, stirring stuff in a cauldron and putting curses and hexes on people or whatever. But that there's a lot of different forms of witchcraft that are practiced all over the world, Throughout every uh, culture, throughout every religious group, um, I mean, it's it, it's a wide variety of things that are that are that are summoned, that are practiced, and in my opinion, this is just one form of that. Yeah, I mean, it definitely seems like it. Um, or one thing I was thinking that while she told me, or uh, while you were talking about how her story, oh, I was thinking like, oh, maybe. Does she maybe still have like a contact with her cult members or whatever the heck they call themselves? And like, does she maybe just have them like she goes to them, gives them some personal items and then have them contracted out to like have them do whatever. So she has no real control over whatever is being done. And then like, so it's like she's not lying in that sense, but she's also just telling her cult members like, hey, attack these guys because they did whatever, whatever to me so well, like, she wouldn't even have to be in contact with them anymore if she knows how to do it yeah th- but she would, is in contact with them right or i mean we don't know yeah that, that's what i was thinking maybe when she said that like oh she's not lying but she's also not innocent in the fact that maybe she's using like her the her cult members or whatever their her segregated group from whatever they were doing as it as like the the I don't know. I don't want to say it without making it seem kind of like goofy and, but basically like hitters, like they're the gunmen, you know, like the, so they contract. Yeah, a lot of times people will go to a, 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 yeah. a, a bruja, mm-hmm. you know, to, as we say in Spanish, so they'll, then they'll do the brujeria. Mm-hmm. They'll put the patrico on you. But this is, this is different to me. Well, um, the repeated cases. Was, yeah, because, me, because she went through three different guys yeah, and I didn't get a, he didn't get, he couldn't tell me the whole scope of what happened to those other guys. He only knew a few different incidents. Um, but you can't, I, I, you know, it, that's not a coincidence. You can't ignore no. that there are three different guys. And if All you take Val, account. who was actually, he was just like the go-between who helped them get together, you know. Yeah, especially, you know, three different people. The only connection is this one lady. Mm-hmm. They're all having similar kind of visions. And it and, affected their girlfriends, their current <laughs> girlfriends and relationships too. And, and she's actively like openly like, yeah, I'm doing it. Mm-hmm. Like, So it's not even like it's a question about what's going on. I was just curious about like what the method is because if well, it she is. She opened up a door that, that obviously just stayed open. I mean, you know. Yeah, I don't. I don't know what what the heck she's doing, but I'm I'm curious to like how much of this is like a part of her, like how much of it is revenge and how much of it is actually like the whole point. It's yeah, like, she enjoys it. Yeah, for sure. And one of the things too, though, that the, and Anthony, this is interesting because you go to the Orthodox Christian Church, mm-hmm. you know, and she, he he recently, according to what he told me, back in November. He started, he joined an Orthodox Christian church, and he said that since November, he's had nothing happen. Now, you got to remember, this is this is January, right? Yeah. So, you know, but but still, that that's good. You know, he's like toward the beginning of, of, of November, nothing has happened. The last time something happened was what date? Let me tell you, Halloween. Oh, yeah, that's typical. He had something happen on Halloween. He was something in the mirror, and when he was shaving, he cut himself shaving, and he sees this weird looking... What he what he described as like a wolf, like kind of like what that other dude described, but with like a serpent tongue, this wolf like creature, like in the mirror behind him, and then it was gone. 
Um, but it, it was right after he cut himself on the neck and he thought, I don't know, man. Um, you know, it's interesting too, because his neighbor at the, at, when, at the height of this, when it was going on there in Florida, his neighbor who also ended up like, um, having some weird stuff happen at his house, you know, uh, he told him that he had a dream of some sort of like female entity that like was kind of snake like and slithered up onto his bed. He couldn't see it, but he was dreaming that something snake like was coming onto his bed. And then, like, when he looked at it in the face, like for a split second, it was there. This is his neighbor, right? This isn't the, this isn't Dan's neighbor, the one that actually messed around with her. No, this is his neighbor who really he, he didn't think that he had ever really met her. And so, you know, she, he had moved in like maybe a year after they had broken up. But all this stuff was going on with this curse, you know, as he calls it. And th the neighbor described this vampiric, weird, snake-like woman. And I say vampiric because it tried to bite him on the neck, you know, like, but it was ethereal, right? Like in a dream. And he said he could just tell it was like this reptilian snake-like, like entity with like some sort of, uh, you know, proclivity for his blood, and he said that it happened to, like more than once. And then they were comparing notes. And he said nothing like that had happened to him, but that his neighbor had that happen to him. And it only started when he was when he moved next door, you know. And um, he thought it was odd, too, that his neighbor found in his trash can a bunch of black feathers. Like somebody had thrown uh, like, a, like a bag of like bird parts like in there in his trash. And he said that it was odd, you know, and his neighbor... He said that, you know, that guy was a devout Christian too, and he started going to church again and praying, and he said that it kind of stopped. There weren't any more incidents. He had a couple weird shadow-like creatures that he would see kind of moving around the house, and after he started getting serious and, like, denouncing in the name of Christ, that it went away. But uh, I thought it was interesting, though, that this guy started going to the Orthodox Church, and he said nothing has happened since then. So I don't, I don't, I don't know— you know, if Matt, if, if this guy is, um, he doesn't like to talk about it. Like, you know, like he, like I tried to get him to say, let's talk about it on the show. He's like, no, I don't want to give it a, you know, he goes, you can talk about it if you want to, but I don't want to. And I think part of it too is because he doesn't want to bring it as a target back to him, you know? Oh yeah. Uh, you know, when we recorded with, um, with Steven Siegel, mm -hmm. you know, he didn't want to talk about his yeah, yeah, there were certain kind of, things that, didn't, that he, he was just comfortable said, I don't bringing want to up. Talk about it, you know, and he's like, "I'll let you tell it," you know. Um, you Which know, is understandable. I mean, you know, yeah, not everybody's willing to talk. There about has this stuff. to be, there has to be like some sort of reason why people tell you don't speak about it. Why there's so many cultures like across the world that are like, "Hey, don't mention it. Don't don't even talk about it because we don't want to hear about it, or you don't want to bring it up, or you don't want to invoke it by speaking of it." So there has to be. Some credence. To well, I th I th and to me, though, because we've talked about so much stuff on this show, I think a lot of it, I mean, I'm going to say there's a lot of it's superstition. And I'm not saying that it's unfounded, but I think if you're prayed up and you're protected, I mean, you know, but it's different if you're in the eye of the storm, if you're if you're a part of that, you know, and it's happening if to you. If you're being affected by it all yeah, the time. Yeah, I would know. definitely understand you not wanting to talk about it um, because, you know, we can talk about it. We're not the target. But- by the same token, you know, I wouldn't focus and dwell on it and give it too much power, you know, but that's easy to say when you're not the one that's being like, you know, raked over the coals by these, whatever they are. Um, you know, it's always easy for somebody to give you advice about what to do. It's like we were talking on the live stream the other night about with Stetson Lewis, you know, about the fighters, you know, and they're like, yeah, man, you should arm bar that dude while you're sitting there eating nachos and drinking yeah. beer. It's easy to be like, oh, that guy's, you know, he should have done this and done that. You could have hold on for nine seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because Stetson's a bull rider and, a, and an MMA fighter. But, you know, it, it, it to me... I don't put a lot of credence into like, I think that you, whatever the power is, you give it that power. And, you know, and God gives us the ability to take it away in the name of Jesus. That's how I feel. That's what I believe. Not everybody's going to feel the way I do or believe the way I do. And I understand that, but everybody's okay with, you know, whatever it is that you believe, whatever. Um, all I got to say is this, you're going to hell. I mean, that's all I got to say about that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you are. I you definitely are. Uh, I won't you see you there. 
<laughs> but you have fun with that. <laughs> Sucks for you. <laughs> you believe what you want, but it's your soul that's going to burn in hell. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Well, anyways, folks, uh, enough messing around here. We got to run. Um, you know, be sure and check us out every Tuesday. We retell people's encounters. Every Thursday, we have a uh, we we have a guest on and we talk. And then Friday, we have a guest on that comes on the live stream. And then Sunday, we retell people's encounters again. Four nights a week of PRT, folks. In the meantime, don't let the Anubis bite. Good night. <laughs>